Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast. I'm your host today, current New Jersey Devils defenseman, Connor Carrick. Our guest today, Josh Pauls, a.k.a. Spuds, is a three-time Paralympian sled hockey gold medalist uh, in 2010, 2014, 2018. 2018, he was the captain uh, for the Pyeongchang team. Uh, he is an exceptional individual. Ten months old, he had both legs amputated as he was born uh, without a tibia in either leg. Uh, we talk a little bit about uh, his nickname, how he became known as Spuds. Uh, he's a relentlessly positive and practical person, and I'm very excited to share with you his story as we both learn from Josh Pauls. Let's do this. Josh Pauls, uh, I call you Spuds because that's how you're introduced to me. I think at the hockey think tank is where we met in Chicago mm-hmm. a couple years ago with Jeff Lavecchio and Topher Scott. Is that when we first met? I think it had to have been because I, I know you were traded to the Devils before that, right? Or was that after? You know, you're going to test me now. Like time's blurred for me like over this pandemic. I have no idea what's what. Well, especially in hockey times too. Yeah. Because I, I'll, I'll talk about you know, what it was like being at, just like we were off air. So we played the uh, New York Islanders yesterday and my D coach from there, John Gruden was, um, you know, coach for the Islanders. Now he's, he's grown, you know, through the game. And I'll talk about that. Like it was yesterday. And I think it's almost, t- it's 10 years ago now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, that's a, that's a, that's an eternity in hockey years, uh, 10 years, but let's together you know, I know you are, you know, three-time, you know, Paralympian and, and gold medalist. Uh, I know you are doing, you know, motivational speaking full-time now. But let's start with, I guess this this was, I had a podcast recently with Steve Dangle, and, and I took tried to take a similar angle where let's take, you know, five, ten minutes and just celebrate the game of hockey. You know, a, as, a, as a young player, as a young man, what do you remember about falling in love with the game? What is it about hockey that is so special as a young player. Cause I, I just remember growing up, there's no sensation like it, right? You can't mm-hmm. glide, you can't skid, uh, you know, on cement the way you would maybe in tennis. I could see it where you're, I don't play tennis, but I've, I can kind of see where guys, you know, slide into shots and that sensation I would imagine be similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it comes to the game of hockey, it's such a special sport we share. Oh, it's, it's unlike anything else. I mean, for me, like I started, I mean, I grew up in New Jersey, so like my parents were Devils fans. So, you know, for me to be able to say, hey, I'm on a podcast with uh, Connor Carrick, that's kind of fun for me to poke and prod my parents with. But, you know, I remember my one vivid memory is I was watching my dad. He was or I was in the living room. My dad was watching a Devils game and I was like, so what's that? And he started explaining some of the rules like icing off sides, like they're skating around, they're sc- trying to score and. I was like, oh, well, I kind of want to start that. So I started playing a little like shinny because, I mean, I was born, so I was born without uh, two shin, bo- my shin bones, uh, my tibias, which are the bigger bone in your shin. Um, and like kneecaps and foot bones, like a bunch of other stuff. I, But it's easier to just say a tibia bone, right? So uh, 10 months old, I had my legs amputated. Well, I say I had my legs amputated. My parents had the decision to have my legs amputated, which I maintain is probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. But uh, maybe that's just my optimistic demeanor. And so uh, I was never really able to, to get on the ice and stand up and skate, although there is uh, on Instagram some evidence of me skating on full on skates, but we can get into that later. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but like just watching that game. And then um, when I was around eight years old, a sled team came down to, to an area near me to go play a, a stand up team because that's what sled teams do, right? Because back in the day, there were only, you know, so many in the country. So you go, you have some extra sleds, you get put these able-bodied kids in sleds for the first time, you beat the crap out of them, you win the game, and they end up giving you you money for your organization. So I maintain sled players are probably the best con artists you're ever going to meet. Um, we get the win, we get the money, we get everybody Come going wild. Guys game. Are, oh, yeah. No, we are 100% in control. We're paying the refs, we're making, well, if they're not volunteering and giving us all the calls, you know. so. I got to watch one of those games and I I hopped in a sled for the first time. And I don't know if it was just like, I was the only one that wasn't a normal sled player that is just trying it out. But there were, you know, newspapers there. And I remember just hating it. 
Like I was just like, this isn't for me. This is too much. I'm not a fan. And I just got off the ice. I was like, get me out of here. So uh, it wouldn't have worked out anyway. The teams were in South Jersey down in Voorhees, Vineland, and it just wasn't going to be feasible for me to travel that or my parents to drive me down there. And so a team opened up in Woodbridge that's now the Woodbridge Warriors. And that's who I started playing hockey with. And man, they said, hey, just go give it one more try. So I tried it one time. And for whatever reason, I was hooked. I wanted to be a goalie. They wouldn't let me be a goalie. Um, thank goodness. Cause yeah, you're welcome. Well, yeah. Right. Gift like, that is for real, man. I, I don't know how I would have turned out if I was a goalie, man. Um, but I just remember that it's that freeing feeling like the movements, unlike anything else. And maybe it's because like, I just, I never really felt had the sensation of like running or had that like air running through my hair, which I really don't have much of now, but you know, I did a little bit when I was a kid. And so to be able to have that feeling of just being able to go fast, like Ricky Bobby, you know, just, I want to go fast and be able to do laps, you know, run into the boards. Cause you don't know how to stop. I mean, I think that that's kind of the beauty of sl sled hockey specifically, because most of the time, nobody really knows what they're doing. Uh, it's parents that are try just trying to get their kids active and it's organizations that may not, you know, be hockey organizations. They're just trying to get kids involved in sport. And so for me to have to try to figure everything out on my own with, you know, my other buddies, you know, Bobby, Kevin, Connor, everybody we started with, I think it was just, it was so fun to say, Hey, I lifted the puck for the first time. They're like, all right, how'd you do it? I'm like, I don't know, but we can figure it out. You know, it's just, it's a lot of self-learning. And I think that constant challenge plus the reward of ending up figuring it out was something that always drove me back to hockey. You know, I, I share that where when I first grew up, I remember I had skates that were too narrow. So like all of my earliest memories, my dad is, you know, picking little Connor up and throwing me on top of the net and re, you know, loosening my skates. And then finally, I think I was in, you know, Bowers in the at the time and got into CCM, which was a wider boot. And mm -hmm. that was it. Always took it, you know, super seriously and played other sports, loved baseball, thought golf was fun, but too slow. Hockey, for whatever reason, just had my heart. The sensation of the, you know, the wind blowing by you, the, the flex on your stick. And same mm -hmm. thing, I, uh, I, I guess I have so much appreciation for, you know, the way that you put your love for the game because it really is the ideals of sport boiled down, right? You're really just trying to control the controllable. Uh, you can't, you know, control what you can't. You know, you were born without tibias and you wanted to do something competitive and productive that felt good and was fun. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's really where it stems from. I needed a competitive outlet. I was always a competitive guy. I mean, I used to trip my sister all the time. My mom would ask me and she'd be like, why'd you just trip her? I was like, cause she has legs. And I don't think my mom knew what to say to that because <laughs> she was just ruthless. like, all right, yeah, we'll yeah. stop it. But like, kind of funny, like I, I as yeah. a parent, I couldn't handle it. I don't think, <laughs> but I mean, just, I needed that competitive outlet. And, you know, I mean, I think growing up, like I can't be more complimentary of everyone at, you know, growing up as in school, like everybody kept me involved in gym class. If I couldn't jump rope, well, I had one, somebody, two people on each end of the jump rope that fling it over my head. I'd step over it and I fling over like, I was always, I always wanted to participate, but I always knew there was something that I just, that was always going to hold me back from realizing like a full competitive potential. And I think hockey was the first thing that I found that I could call my own because I tried wheelchair basketball. I saw them flipping around with, with like head over wheels with no pads on. I was like, nah, like that's not for me. Like pad me up, throw a helmet on in a cage and I can, I can just go around like a little bowling ball. But like, I mean, that's the greatest part about hockey I think is just the freeing aspect of it. Right. It's you get on the ice and all of a sudden as a kid, I don't have to worry about what homework I have because that's like a later me problem. That's a future me problem. Right. And I don't have to worry about, you know, anything that's happened before because that's a pass me problem, right? It's just, I need to problem solve on the ice. I have to figure out how to make this pass, how to score a goal. And that's just a hundred percent what I love about hockey. Yeah. The flow state, the, the challenge mm -hmm. of the now, uh, for, for people who've maybe never seen uh, sled hockey, explain to them how you are able to get around the rink, explain, you know, sort of a little bit of the equipment and, you know, the sticks you guys use and, and how you're able to accelerate and decel. Yeah. So, uh, sled, it's pretty much all the same rules as stand up. We've got two skate blades on t underneath a uh, metal frame. They're usually aluminum pipes and they come around in front. Um, if you have feet, you put your feet on the end of that. If you don't, your sled gets to be a certain minimum length. Um, you've got two sticks instead of one. So, uh, our coach, Jeff Sauer, who used to 
coached the national team, coached at Wisconsin and Colorado College a little bit. Um, he always used to say that we were the most talented sled play, talented players he's ever seen because we can shoot and pass with both hands. I mean, I'm sure you it's something that you have to actively account for in your game, right, Connor? Like, oh, I'm on my backhand. I can't make a play that I normally would be able to. Where sled, I can play left D, I can play right D because if I'm proficient with both hands, I can make a play or I can, you know, go, throw it uh, left to right, chip it off the glass where if I just had it on my left and only had a left forehand, it's going to be a lot harder play, right? Yeah, absolutely. How do you, um, how do you prepare for, you know, competition? Cause I know, you know, as a, as a stand up hockey player, I'm assuming we have, I've seen your Instagram and with Jeff Lavecchio in the gym, like talk about your preparation, uh, pre-tournament, you know, and maybe even how it's evolved from, you know, 2010 to, you know, your latest, uh, latest and greatest, you know, techniques. Yeah. Oh, it's come a long way. I mean, I went from not actually having a warm up to, you know, having a set warm up, and, um, I, you know, it's evolved from, okay, I have to do this one, this, you know, five, these five things that I specifically do every single time to, well, if I find something new, why, sh- why don't I add it? Because I can, work on it when I'm practicing, when I'm playing a game that may not mean as much, when I'm not in a gold medal situation, right? And I can take something, see if it works, right? I'm always someone that's trying to experiment you, right? You you always want to find the next greatest thing. And so I'm always kind of tweaking that warm up. But you know, when I first started, I mean I first made a national team at 15 years old. Um I the year before in 2008, I was on the junior national team. We went up to Marlboro, Massachusetts. It hosted the USA Hockey Disabled Festival, which is for every single discipline of disabled hockey. And it just so happens that the world championships were there too. So I got to watch the big boy national team compete against Canada, Norway. Norway had was a powerhouse and they're still one of the top, I think five or six teams in the, in the world right now, but to watch them play, uh, you know, the big boys of Canada, I mean, those guys were unreal back in the day and they still, Canada still has a really strong team, but we've definitely caught up to them a lot. But, you know, I got to see my, teammate Steve Cash, who I, you know, live 20 minutes from now, I get to watch him have to make 30 saves because um, we just, we weren't there as a team yet. Right. And I remember watching those guys going, Hey, one day I could be that good. I could be on that team. And the very next year they called me up without actually trying out. Like we have tryouts every July. Um, I left and I got a call from the GM and he was like, Hey, uh, are you coming to tryouts? And I was like, no, I didn't think I was ready. And he was like, all right, well, we want to invite you to our first camp and we'll just see what we got. That'll be your tryout. I mean, I was brutal. I I was brutal. I was 15 years old going against grown men, man. And I remember just being out of my league, but loving every second of it. I mean, our equipment guy, Bill Sandberg, he gave me my my practice jersey. He's like, all right, this guy's probably not going to be back. Let me keep it. I was like, oh, that's not a good sign. And then, uh, and then I was back and I made the world championship team that year. Um, wasn't because of my skill. I sat on the bench way more than I played. I had one shift in the gold medal game of the 2009 World Championships. I remember I got the puck right around the top of the left circle in our zone, but I lost it underneath my sled. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to screw this up. It's a 0-0 game. I just clamped down on my sl- on my sides, on my sled. If I can't get the puck, nobody else is going to get the puck. We ended up getting out, and that was the only shift I played. But I had the best seat in the house sitting on the boards. Because for those that don't know, like when we're sitting on the bench – the benches are lowered so they're flush with the ice. The the boards are replaced with plexiglass so we can see out of it. So, I mean, I had better than a front row seat to watch us score with 11 seconds left to win our first ever world championship. And then the next year I got cut. Um, the next July, I tried out for the team for the first time and then they cut me. Uh, they said uh, there were guys that were bigger, stronger, faster. Just, I mean, it, it's a Paralympic year. It's a once every four years event. And they just said, Hey, we need guys that are ready to go right now. You're not quite ready to go right now, but it'll be all right. And so I remember driving home from Rochester, New York and my dad's minivan. And he looks at me and he goes, well, if you don't like it, we'll just work harder. I was like, all right. And just go prove them wrong. And I was like, all right, I can do that. So I, I actually started getting in the gym. I mean, before that probably had never touched a weight. I did some like resistance training with some bands, but never like really lifting. I mean, it was my first, second year of high school at that point. And so I mean, I, I never had professional aspirations because sled hockey was never a professional game. But to be able to to try to say, screw you to the, some of these coaches and say, you know, I can make this team. 
um, it, it was kind of fun. It was uh, me against the world. And then I ended up beating out a couple guys for some of the last spots in Vancouver. And the one, the one moment that really sticks out with me is I was, I've always been a defenseman. Uh, well, I say I've always been a defenseman. They converted me to a forward for a while. And that was going to be my role in Vancouver. And I remember sitting on the bench in one of our last pre-Paralympic games, right before they were going to make the cuts. And I was like, man, I just really want to play defense. I was the emergency defenseman, right? I was the guy that moved back to penalty kill. And my teammate, Taylor Lipset, looked at me and he goes, well, that's great. You want to play defense. But the ticket to Vancouver is as a forward. And for whatever reason, that those words just clicked. And I was like, well, I'm going to be the best damn forward I can be. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to be, but I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to play some NHL, you know, 09 and play be a pro so I can figure out where a winger's supposed to go. Like, honestly, like that's where I learned a lot of positional positioning from being a forward because I had no idea. I didn't pay attention. I didn't want to watch. Well, I didn't really want to be a forward, but that was my one way to make it to Vancouver. And that was the way that I had to had to make it. And so I decided, you know what? That's OK. I'll be a forward for however long they need me to be a forward as long as I can stay on this team. How do you continue to cultivate and practice this sense of, you know, conviction, you know, challenge? Uh, these are my controllables and now I'm going to pursue progress with this optimistic sense because I, I, you know, was texting Jeff Lavecchio about you and I said, you know, hey, do you have anything on Spudzy to, to bring up, you know, in the, in the podcast? And he's like, you know, man, I, I have nothing but positive things to say. He said, quote, he's the hardest worker ever super consistent and just a great human. So what is consistency to you? Why is it so important? How do you, what does it look like in the wild? How do you continue to practice it year in, year out, day in, day out? I mean, consistency is something that I don't know if I necessarily have a, had achieved it until I started really working with Jeff, to be honest. Like I was, uh, okay, I'm going to work out here. I'm going to work out there. I mean, I had some trainers, but they weren't always necessarily looking to make me better at hockey. They were always there to, okay, well, he's an athlete. Let's just get him stronger. There was never a plan. And so I could kind of see that and I could, I can only do so much at knowing what I know. Right. And so for me, consistency is consistency in everything, right? How you do one thing is how you do everything. So, you know, finding consistency in the gym, finding consistency in my diet, even, I think that's made the biggest difference over quarantine. I mean, I've played on the national team for, I think this is going to be my 12th or 13th year. And I mean, I'm just now finding my stride to being the player that I want to be. And so consistency, it, it's tough. Like it, it's tough to do the same thing every day, all the time, but consistency for me, I'm not somebody that always likes to work out, right? I don't claim to like to work out. I don't claim to like to pick things up and put them down. But for me, I think. I want to make sure I show up every day with a good attitude because I know Jeff has the plan. I just have to do my stuff, right? I just got to pick up what he tells me to pick up and the way he tells me to pick it up and move it. And I need to make sure that I come in ready to go. So if I, co if I go in and say, I don't really want to work out, I don't really want to do this. Well, the self-talk that I'm giving myself isn't helping me out, right? Even if I don't feel like it, I'm going to act like I feel like it because that action is going to, throw something into my brain going, well, okay, I can do this. I don't have to struggle the last couple of reps or anything because my mind's right. I'm ready to, to give everything I got. I, I want to be consistent in that. I'm going to give you everything I've got every time I'm either in the gym or on the ice. Now that all I've got isn't always my hundred percent. You know what? Maybe I stayed up a little too late last night. Maybe you know, I had a couple too many pops or a couple too many glasses of wine the night before. Uh, that's something I'm actually I've actually kind of cut out of my life for the most part recently, but you know, it's all those things. I'm always going to give you everything I got. It might not be the, the peak Josh, but you're always going to get my best, whatever that best is. And I think to me, that's, that's my consistency. And that's the most consistent thing that I can do to make sure that I'm always at my peak level, or at least at my peak for as long as possible. I love that. Cause it kind of takes some of the guesswork or the decision-making out of the way, you're going to push aside any of the guilt. There's no conversation around, you know, ah, you know, Josh, you should have, I, I, I knew I needed, you know, eight, nine hours of sleep last night. I got in a fight with my fiance. I shouldn't have done that. You mm -hmm. know, th there's no indulging in the negative self-talk. It's okay. This is what my hundred percent of my ability looks like today. 
And the task at hand is going to get that. And we can, we can, you know, banter over what I could have, should have, you know, would have done after my progress is made, but for the next hour, for your training session, your ice time, your game, Mm -hmm. it's sole focus. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, everything, everything I do at the end, I want to ask, what's it accomplish? So if I talk myself down before I actually do anything, what's that actually accomplish? Nothing. If it weakens me, right? But if I reflect on all of that after I've already been in the gym or been on the ice, well, then that's going to help me prepare better for the next time, right? So if it's reflection afterwards, it's fine. If I'm trying to reflect before I even accomplish anything, well, then what's the point? All it's going to do is drive me to go, um, well, maybe I just shouldn't go to the gym anymore. You know, like I don't, what's the point to me, honestly, is something I ask myself all the time. What's the point or what's this accomplishing? And I'm, I mean, I'm a results oriented guy, but to me, results aren't always gold medals, right? Results are showing up in the gym and Jeff Lavecchio telling me I'm his most consistent client or telling me I've never had a bad day. Like that's progress. That's like accomplishment for me. Like, you know, cooking a bomb dinner, like that's accomplishment after, you know, my chest is sore from doing three second negatives and going full stack on weights. Like that's an accomplishment. I mean, I I have conversations all the time with people just out during the day, just look at, I mean, I, okay, I'm going to try to articulate this here. The amount of times I get someone that looks at me at the grocery store, sees my prosthetics and goes, man, you got up this morning. That's amazing. Like, man, all I did was get out of bed. Like, it's not that hard. Like Connor, you put your socks and shoes on. I'm lucky. My shoes are already on my legs. I just got to put my legs on. Like, it's really not not as terrible as it sounds, right? And so for me, perspective is is everything. Perspective is reality. And so if I have a positive perspective on life, on positive outlook on life, well, my life's going to be a little bit more positive because otherwise, like, I just don't want to be miserable, man. I'm just, there's no point in wallowing in self-pity going, oh man, if only I had legs. I mean, I have two perfectly good ones. They get replaced every five years and insurance pays for them. I mean, it's a pretty great deal to me. I mean, I've got, I actually, uh, I had COVID a little while back and I was getting checked out and a guy in the elevator, as we were going down the, down the elevator in the office, he looked at me, he goes, man, that's some rough. I I just had a double knee replacement. I'm like, man, you have it rough. Like you had a surgery, my double knee replacement. I get to pick out my knee. My guy puts it together. We program it. And I'm out there in like 20 minutes. Like that's an easy day for me. I mean, yeah, I got to learn how to use the new thing, but it's not all that hard. It's not rocket surgery. And so for me, like perspective is everything. Perspective is reality for sure. Well, what I love about someone like yourself is when you practice that sense of optimism and you are able to, you know, display sort of this big minded uh, sense of perspective, it really does put the listener, the person talking to you in check. And that's a great power that you use, not, uh, I guess, without abandon. You use it precisely and and positively and humbly. And that's, I think, what I took away from, you know, even our time with the the hockey think taken and, you know, the short time we spent uh, here. It's this blend of optimism and and humor and, you know, candidness that I think makes you so adept to be, you know, what you're doing now, which is motivational speaking. I mean, I'm trying, man. But I think I, I do want to touch on one thing you said, like it keep, keeps the other person in check, right? Like that's not to say that your problems don't have as just as much validity as my problems. Like, yeah, I have problems. Sometimes my leg doesn't fit right. Sometimes I don't know, like I ruin a dinner, I burn something like problems are problems. And I don't think the magnitude of the problem I think the magnitude of the problem is relative to the person, right? So yeah. like everyone's problems are equally valid. Just because I'm missing my legs doesn't mean my problems are any worse. They're just a little different. I mean, I'm more alike with I'm more alike to you than we're different, right? I mean, yeah. I've got ten fingers, I've got a head, a brain, you've got head, a brain, everything, right? Like I think that's the biggest thing that I, I, I want to make sure your audience knows is like I because I get it a lot. I get, man, you know my foot kind of hurt and now I'm feeling not so bad. Well, no, your foot hurts. Like go to the doctor or figure it out or put some ice on it. Like it's still a problem. It doesn't mean you should ignore it. It's just, we have to find ways to better tackle our problems and something that me and Jeff always talk about. It's no problems, only solutions. Like 
all the time. I mean, I, I work all kinds of different stuff. Like working with me is a little bit different for Vex. I mean, we're upper body only for the most part. We're push and pull rather than lower body and upper body. There are ways we have to use leverage because I can't quite lock my knees. I can't pull with my feet. Mm -hmm. um, so we're using re different resistance bands. It's all just really how about how you go about tackling your problems. And I think that kind of comes back to, to me doing some motivational speaking. It's finding ways to help people understand that, you know, problems are problems and we're going to have them. But I think the biggest thing that people don't understand is they think that what happens to them plus the reaction, it's E plus R equals O. It's our events plus our reactions equal our outcomes. And most people think that they can change the event and that will change the outcome. Well, the event's going to happen regardless. The event is independent of what we do, right? So my reaction has to change in order for my outcome to change. Otherwise, I'm just beating my head against the wall and we're going nowhere. So it's all about the reaction to a problem or to an, any kind of event, whether it's good, whether it's bad. I mean, uh, in February of 2017, we lost our head coach, Jeff Sauer, to cancer and in the middle of a season right before the Paralymp a year before the Paralympics. And you know what? We lost that world championship. We lost the final game like four to one. And I, I think everybody kind of had a sour taste in our mouth. We thought, you know what? The, the event that transpired was kind of crappy, but our reaction was equally as crappy. And we came back with a resolve in that 2018 games to, to win something for him. And I mean, I think he helped us out by allowing Canada to hit that post on the empty net in the gold medal game. But, uh, but for me, like it's, we have to change the reaction in order to change the, the outcome. Well, you know, one of the things that I've, I've really learned and relearned and relearned over the course of this podcast, because I've gotten the opportunity to talk with or interview, however you want to coin it, some really special, you know, high performance people and their life is not void of problems. Their life is not void of even, you know, the doubt, uh, you know, the sadness, the disappointment that comes with what's perceived as a negative event. But that cycle, the, the, the time in which they're able to deal with that negative reaction and then get over that hump and, and get over the you know, sense of inertia is so impressive. And it really is a muscle that you can practice and continue to get better with over the course of your life. Mm -hmm. Oh, 100%. I mean, when I was younger, when I was 17 years old on the team, I'd be sitting on the bench going, Man, I just wish coach, coach put me out. I deserve to be out there. I haven't been out there in like 10 minutes. Like they should just put me out there. Well, you know what? Like that's not going to help anything, right? So for me, it was always, all right, well, I got to start working better. And so that I give him a reason to put me out there. Like I can't control who he's going to put out there, but I can control that I'm going to be so good. He's not going to have a choice but to put me out there. And it, it 100% is inertia. And it's something you have to constantly focus on because you know, sitting on the bench, you know, at 17 years old, I was sitting there going, oh man, probably gonna lose this game. We're down two goals. Like, bro, like it's, it's 30 minutes left. Like we still have two periods. Like what am I saying to my, if I am already saying that we're, we've lost then we've already lost now it's, oh man, we gave up a goal. All right. Time to get one back. Oh, we gave up another goal. All right. Time to get two back. Like, it's just, it's automatic now. And like you said, like it's something you work at and it's something that eventually just like anything, it becomes second nature. Like for me, walking, it's just for like you, we walk different ways, but it's second nature because we've just done it so many damn times. And so I think finding ways to, to have a positive self-talk, but also to, I don't know, I, for me, it's what would a, fr a good friend say to me? And if I'm not talking like a good friend to myself, how quickly would I cut that person out of my life? If that makes sense. Like, why am I going to get real down on myself when I'm the only one that can hear me? You know, I think that's kind of the cool part about starting my own business and running, um, running my speaking company basically by myself. Because anytime I, somebody catches me talking to myself, I'm just like, "Oh, sorry, I'm having a staff meeting." Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, group group meeting. Yeah, I think uh, you touched on it. Where speaking to yourself, like pers uh, somebody that you care for or that you deeply mm -hmm. love, uh, or at least have a lot of respect for, that's something. You know, I, I had uh, the pleasure of playing with John Hayden, who's one of my best friends in the whole hockey world. He's in Arizona now. And, you know, we were, you know, both in and out of the lineup and dealt with injury and different things. And 
he was somebody that, as a teammate, was so supportive um, and so, you know, he really operated from this place of, you know, hey, Connor, I, I know you've been able to see that, you know, really difficult circumstances can arise in this game, but that also means almost by definition that really, really good things can happen. And he was so persistent in this positivity. And it really wasn't until I spent a full year with him that I was like, I, if you were to ask me point blank, Connor, how's your self-talk? I'd say, it's pretty good for the most part. Like, I'm mm-hmm. usually pretty positive. I could be abrasive. You know, I could be, yeah. um, you know, demanding at times. But it wasn't until, until I really spent a lot of time with a good friend to that degree where I was like, okay, my positive, my, my self-talk isn't that positive. Mm-hmm. My self-talk <laughs> isn't, you know, that consistent. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just listening to a podcast. It's brilliant. Have you, uh, it's Tim Ferriss and Dr. Jim Lure. Are you a Tim Ferriss fan at all? Tim Fer- I don't know if I know the name. Man, I he's, need to, uh, well, well, don't listen to him. Just listen to my podcast. It's better. But if, if by chance you get bored of, of listening to, um, the curious competitor podcast, Tim Ferriss has one with Dr. Jim Lure, who's a you know, sports psychologist, uh, amongst other titles. He, he had a whole host of titles mm-hmm. and he discusses this concept where, you know, if your self-talk isn't presentable enough to be on like the jumbotron as when you're playing, if, if you're not proud of it enough that if it were so public that it would upset you or be something you want to hide, it's time to reevaluate. And I really, I'm expecting a child. My wife, uh, Lexi, I think is 37 and a half or 38. I don't know. She's very pregnant. Um, and uh, it's one of the things I've thought about. Like if I am going to be a father, I have to model this stuff. Otherwise this, this abrasive self-talk will be generational. Like I'll hand it down. Um, which is fine. I'm all for honest reflection, but I think there's a huge disparity between honest reflection and you're berating yourself for months or years after mistakes have been made. Oh, well, that's the thing. Like for me, I look back anytime, like my brain races and I pull, start pulling up just random stupid stuff from like when I was a kid and I'm going, Oh man, I'm remember when I did that, when I said that one thing or when I thought that like, I don't know, just some random thing from when I was a teenager, I I sit there and I go, okay, what is it accomplishing? Can I fix it? Can I change it? No. Okay. Can I learn from it? Probably. So what can I learn from it? Right. It's a whole process. I'm a very logical guy. And so like, that's the thing I need to make sure that I'm not dwelling on things that isn't going to do me any good because what's the point of spending time on it? I might as well just, you know, go for a walk, play a game of Xbox, like cook something in the kitchen, like make some coffee. I don't know, like anything more productive than just, dwelling on something that I can't necessarily control or change. Like, I mean, for me, you only get one chance at pretty much anything. And I don't, I try not to have any regrets. And I, I can pretty much say I don't have any regrets in my life because I realized that I only had one chance at anything, right? I only had one chance to reflect and go, you know what, screw these coaches. I'm going to try to make this national team again. I only had one chance to say, yeah, John, I want to go hang out with that random friend, Katie, that you know, that is now my fiance. Like, I only had one shot at that. And I nailed it, apparently. But, like, those are things that, you not know, a I big don't want to. Yeah, no, not a big deal. <laughs> just Slam random dunk. connection. But, like, that's the thing. Like, you just, I don't want to focus on things that aren't going to do me any good in the future. And I think to your point of becoming a father and passing that stuff on, like, I think the biggest thing that I learned from some of my coaches, some of, you know, our captains on the national team was that you don't always have to be a leader or think of yourself as a leader for someone else to think at, think as of you as a leader. And so for me, I, I always want to act as if someone's watching me lead, like whatever decision I make, if someone's going to scrutinize it, I want them to say he made the right choice. Now I make, I try to make the right choice for all the knowledge that I have. And I try not to dwell on mistakes that I've made, but I think a mistake's only a mistake if you make it twice. If you can make a mistake and learn from it and we can grow from it, then it's not really a mistake. It's just a learning opportunity. Now, if I make the same mistake twice and I keep going back to the same, you know, same old bad habits of drinking too much beer or having a couple too many glasses of wine or whatever it is, then I got to reevaluate and and be a little critical on myself, but also realize that, you know, a little, I don't want to say negative self-talk, but a little reprimanding in my self-talk isn't a bad thing. It's keeping me honest and it's being real, right? It's being realistic. Now, if I'm sitting here going, 
well, man, I want to lose a couple of pounds. Let me just, you know, drink water for the next week. Well, that's not really realistic, especially as an athlete, right? So the responses have to be in equal magnitude to the problems, I think. Well, that just comes down to, you know, how you identify as a person, right? Being mm -hmm. someone who's very logical, pragmatic, uh, acting as someone who really does have, you know, Josh Paul's best interest at heart. And that's really what it comes down to. And a lot of what I try to accomplish with this podcast is giving our listener, giving people the tools or stories or access to the right people that can allow them to play on their own team, to, to act within their own best interest. Because I do consider myself someone, you know, maybe type A, uh, extremely competitive, high standards for myself. I'm a professional athlete. It's not easy to play in the National Hockey League. I, I respect how far, you know, I've come. And even I, at this level, have dealt with you know, self-sabotage. And I think it's that perspective of, you know, it's, it's something that I used to write down in my journal. I would write the date, you know, let's say what's today, the 22nd of January. I would say, you know, today is 1-22-2021. It's one of one today. You only get one opportunity. Like my entire life, to, not to be overly dramatic, but my entire life has led to this moment, this exact moment, right? And that I think is al allows me to think from that big brain, from that open heartedness that, you know, I am capable of being the hero in this story because the story is not over. I mean, I think, uh, my buddy, Kevin Rempel up in Canada, he played on the Canadian sledge team for a while. I, I don't know why I just called it sledge. They call it sledge up there. And I just like, guess I just use that. I hate we forgive him. for that. We forgive. Thank him. you. I hope so. Um, but he always says, be the hero of your own movie. Like, and I love that phrase because in some ways we all are. I mean, yeah, you can think of it as, you know, oh, well, not everyone's going to be the, the main star, but everyone's the main star in our own head, right? And for me, like, I'm going to be a star by, like I said, I, I love to cook. So I'm going to be a star by cooking a great breakfast, cooking a great dinner, by getting out and working out and lifting with Vex, by going out and practicing and coaching because I'm kind of Reg Dunlapping from Slapshot, the uh, player Love coach that. with St. Louis here. So like it's, I only get one chance at it. I only get one chance to, to help people learn the game, to help teach people the game. I only get one chance to, you know, try to win a gold medal in 2022, hopefully, or even world championships whenever that's coming up for us in 2021. So like you just, you got to embrace the challenge and you got to enjoy it. And that's the thing, like, you know, I, we've, won plenty of world championships. We've won the Paralympics. We've also lost a couple worlds um, on my tenure with the team. And I don't really want to look back on them and any, on any of them and go, well, you know, I wish we won. Obviously I wish we won. I'm competitive. I, I don't want Canada to end up with those gold medals, but you know, like at the end of the day, it's a game. Um, it's not my job as terrible as it is to say, like hockey really isn't my job right now. Um, it's, I'm not a professional, but it's something I love to do and it's something I'm going to give my all for. And so the thing is like, if I lose a game, if we lose a game, if we lose some, some big games sometime coming up, I don't think it's ever going to happen because we have Declan Farmer and Brody Roybal, who, you know, and yeah, I know Brody. Yeah. I, I think that's amazing, man. Like when you, uh, I think when we first started talking, you brought up, brought up Brody and I was like, man, like you actually know this kid. I didn't think uh, I didn't think he got around all that well, but now he's in Nashville, just tearing it up. Yeah, I met him. Um, oh God, what was the name of the event? It was for. Uh, oh my goodness! It was the Tannenbaum family invited me to this this awesome event at. Oh my God, Shirley Ryan. It was the Shirley yep. Ryan. Um, the ability the lab, medical ability lab. Thank you, mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, it was really cool. Me and me and Brody were able to throw down and talk hockey a little bit and, you know, met his, uh, I think, girlfriend, right? Menaces? Yep, Menaces. Yep. Sweetheart. So, oh, sweetheart. She's, she's so nice. Like, I don't know uh, I don't know how they work because it's Brody and Menaces is just the nicest person ever. But <laughs> I, I love Brody to death, though. Like, I mean, for people that aren't, that don't know, I mean, I actually talked to a buddy, uh, Vex's cousin. I was like, hey, I'm hopping on this The Curious Competitor podcast. I need to give these listeners like an idea of like who Brody and like Declan are. Declan Farmer, one of the best in the world. So is Brody Roybal. I mean, if you're thinking of Brody Roybal, like I just got, I worked so hard on these. I got to get these out. Like Brody is a, is a Brad Marchand. If you like a Brad Marchand kind of player, like a in your face, but still has all the skill in the world. Like I've, 
I watched him get teed, which is a penalty in sled where it's basically you get hit perpendicular uh, with a sled instead of like full body contact. I remember I saw him get teed. He kept the puck, yelled at the ref, was like, why isn't that a tee? As he's staring at the ref, scores a goal. And I just was like, wow, this dude was so mad. He was staring at the ref, yelling at him while scoring. Like, I can't ever hope to be that good, right? Like, That's sick. It's just him and Farmer. Like, Farmer, he's, he's your Ryan O'Reilly. He's your Pavel Datsuk. Just slick hands, great defensively, scores goals. Like, those guys are just next level. And I can't tell you how, how fun it is to be able to just flip pucks up to those guys and just say, go get them, guys. Like I'll yeah, be back I'll take, here. I'll take, an, I'll take an assist from my own goal line. Thanks, guys. Oh, oh yeah, it's the best way to do it. As much as I like jumping in the rush, I mean, there's not no feeling like it being the weak side D coming flying down the middle of the ice and getting the pass right on your stick. Yeah, Nick Lidstrom style. Oh, uh, I wouldn't go that far, but trying, <laughs> always striving aren't, for aren't, it. Aren't we all? Aren't, the most nervous I've ever been in practice was we were practicing at uh, the outdoor game for the Centennial Classic for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm-hmm. and they were doing like an alumni game and all of a sudden we were doing two-on-ones at the end of practice and Nick Lidstrom was on the glass and I'm like oh no man I hope I knock down like 55 pucks in a row and and not allow you know a single shot on net uh in honor of this guy just because he was so magical with his ability to you know def- deflect plays yeah just he'd kill it like you try to dump it in and he's just like nope it's going the other way like before you even have a second to think about it like Oh, hey, that dumping didn't go in. Like, it's already in the back of your net. Like, it's just, man, some of those guys, like, watching, it's it's so fun to to kind of pull. I think that's actually one of my favorite things about watching the NHL is trying to pull things you guys are able to do and convert it to sled. Because our games are, as, as similar as they are, they're very different. Like, you're coming back, you're skating, you're playing a two-on-one, you're, you have both guys in front of you, right? I'm pulling a two on one. I need to gap up and I need to have one guy over my one shoulder. And the, usually the other guy's either over my other one or he's sitting in my blind spot right behind me. So like finding ways to, to slide, to block, to drag a pick. Like, I mean, my version of a, a full on body slide to pu- prevent a pass is sticking my one stick out in front of me and dragging the back pick behind me to try to prevent them from saucing something up behind me. Like it's, it's so fun to, to, like I said earlier, to problem solve, to see that and go, you know what? How can I use that? I'm sure I can find a way to use that. I mean, Scott Niedermeyer and Brian Rafalsi were some of my favorite defensemen growing up. I mean, like I said, well, I, I'm a Devils fan now. I actually grew up a Rangers fan. Uh, it's probably not what most people want to hear, but like, I mean, it's it's fun for me as a fan because you know I'm cheering for the Devils. I'm a New Jersey guy, but it's fun for me watching from a tactical perspective too. And I think that's, that's kind of the fun nuances of not really having any skin in the game with the NHL. Like I, I knew I was never going to ma- reach the NHL. I mean, Hey, it's still a possibility, just not as a player. Right. And so I, I think it's, it's a fun dynamic to be able to, to be an elite athlete, understand some of the things you guys are going through and some of the things you guys have to do away from the rink, but also being a fan and going, man, I just hope these guys win every game and score, you know, thousands of goals and light it up and win the cup, you know? I love that. Yeah, I mean, that whole concept of being able to create, you know, as much of a barrier as possible, that was something that as a young player, I, you know, had to learn. I, I was like, I, I could never understand how these, you know, more veteran D-men were able to be so proficient on their two-on-ones. They have two guys, you're the single back, like you're obviously at a huge disadvantage. And this concept of like, okay, you can take up, you know, as much ice if your stick's on the ice, as long as your blade is, however many yep. inches that is. And then either your feet can be in total, you know, parallel and you can take mm-hmm. up exactly one, you know, skate blade mm-hmm. or yep. you can kind of like scissor them and double, mm-hmm. you know, the amount of uh, passing lane you're able to take up. And uh, Mike Babcock used to say always like stick and feet, stick and feet, stick and feet. And I was like, huh, I always knew like, you know, have a good stick, but I never really considered what my feet were doing on different lanes. Even uh, yeah. I was talking to Andy Green about this last year and he was discussing when he goes out on a penalty kill, just to, I don't know, I guess explain the level of detail and, and level of savviness that's on uh, display every night in the National Hockey League. He was explaining, you know, when he goes down like to a, a knee, right? He goes down like mm-hmm. a single knee to sort of drop his, his leg flat so that no pucks can get under where his toe Right. Like if his toe yep. cap was just on the ice and it, it would leave a, a little hole. like a little hole there. So he would kind just of go flat. Too. 
yeah, and it was so cool, uh, you know, to listen to, I don't know, just the the level of expertise and and you know the level of sneakiness that goes on at the NHL level. At all, you are yeah. always able to learn something. And even, you know, if you're watching the Devils game, you know, I'm out of the lineup right now, and and that mm-hmm. really has been my focus. I really do feel we have you know, sort of a freebie season. There was doubt that we were even going to have one. Uh, just grateful to to be here. I, you know, I was never really raised to just be happy to hold a stick, but at the same time, I've really tried to borrow from uh, one of our sports scientists, Devin McConnell. He was hired by the Coyotes as well. A couple of my good friends obviously went to Arizona. And, uh, you know, he said, I don't know if I shared this story on the podcast yet, but I said, hey, Dev, when he was leaving, I, I you know, didn't shake his hand because of COVID, but I, you know, did my little bow that I was doing. I said, thanks for Thanks for everything, man. We spent, you know, a lot of time together when, when I was injured. Um, you were always positive when I, you know, you came to the rink, you always had great energy and I fed off it and you'll be missed is what I said. I said, you'll be missed. And I'm going to get him on the podcast at a later date, but he almost got, you know, it, it emotionally hit him a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, thank you. And then later that day he said, you know, sees, I got to say like, thanks for the comment. All I ever wanted to do was leave the jersey better. And I've totally stolen that. And you, you strike me as someone that you have this simplicity in your approach that really allows you to have success, allows you to gain momentum, allows you to fight the power of inertia, which is whatever room you're in, whatever jersey you're wearing, leave it better. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't pass that binary standard, if it's not plus one or minus one, it, it becomes so simple you know, to know what the right course of action is. A hundred percent. I mean, I think... Leaving the jersey better, it was something that, you know, I I thought about. I now that you now that you say that, I feel like you might have told that story on a previous pod because my coach. It's one of my favorites. That. It's my it's my back part. It's my back uh, pocket ace. Well, my coach referenced that. He was like, Yeah, you gotta listen to this one episode. And I'm like, I thought I told you about this this podcast, and now you're telling me to watch it, listen to episodes. But like I, I think that's something that, you know, I from a young age, like I wanted to be the captain of the national team. Like that was my goal was to make the national team. Right. Then I wanted to be the captain, like even from 17, but I wanted to be it because I saw the effect that those guys had, like our first captain, Andy Yoey, he was, he was from Iowa. Like the dude is just the most fierce competitor you you've ever seen. Like I got scared going into corners with him when I was 17. Cause he just was a mate. Like I saw him just jabbing guys, like just going to town on board battles. And I was like, well, I'm nervous as heck. I don't want to go against this guy, but man, I want to be just like him. And like, so to watch him and, and just the way he conducted himself, the way he carried, the way he led the team, he was just, he was a personable guy. He, you could talk to him about anything, but he was always going to tell you exactly how he felt. And that was something that, you know, I've strived to, to continue to do, to bring along. Um, our, another captain we had was Josh Sweeney. He was a, a Marine who, uh, a Marine sharpshooter, sniper, one of the two, I think ended up getting blow, blown up in Iraq, I think. And he was our captain for a while. And one story I tell, I tell in my book, I tell everywhere was we were at the 2012 world championships in Norway. And we had just gotten the news that instead of 15 players, we could carry 17. And so we dressed everybody. We were on the bench getting ready to go. And our GM comes hollering down right, right after puck drop. He's like, Rico, Josh, I need you off the bench right now. Like pulls him literally off the bench. I was getting ready to play D. They start moving me up to forward. Like everything's shuffling around. We get back to the, to the uh, locker room after the first period. And like they're in street clothes. We're looking at him like, what the heck just happened? They were like, oh, well, we screwed up. The rules were uh, we can carry 17. We can only dress 15. And so if we had played or hopped on the ice, like we would have forfeited the game. Um, we played Estonia that game. I'm not sure they still have a sled team. Um, so that's how the, the, the disparity in levels, how we were like, no, nothing against them, but like we were by far the better team and they took us to a shootout. We barely won. So, I mean, that threw us for a loop, but I remember Josh wasn't even a captain at this time. And he, he looked at us and was like, yeah, well, you know, we'll just get in next game. It's no big deal. Like, you were just pulled from playing in your first ever world championship game, thrown in the locker room, and you were just like, eh, whatever, I'll get him next time. And that had such an impact on me, just like when Taylor told me, well, the ticket to Vancouver's as a forward. And, you know, so it's, 
leaving the jersey better is always just I've seen so many people do it that now I want to make sure that I leave the same legacy. I don't really care what much else my legacy is besides, I mean, obviously, the more gold medals, the better. Like, that's just how I feel. That's my results oriented me. But the thing is, like, I just want to make sure that the team's in a good spot whenever I do decide to pack it up. Because, I mean, I'll go as long as they'll let me um, for the most part. I mean, eventually, I'm just going to have to call it. But the thing, like, I just, I want to make sure that everybody has that same, that same captain that I had. I want to be the Andy Yohi for the next guys coming up. And that's like, that's the really cool part with Jack Wallace. I don't know if you know him. He's from New Jersey too. No, I don't know. Um, single leg. He lost his leg in a boating accident. And uh, he started in the same sled team I did in New Jersey. And he was there when I brought home my, my medal from Vancouver. And he tells the story that he was like, yeah, well, I want to do that now. And, you know, in, he made the team in 2018. Um, we ended up play. He ended up playing on D when he moved back to. Fo- he was a forward, moved back to D. So the running joke we have is just if you're a guy from Jersey, you can play forward in D. It doesn't really matter on the national team. Anybody else? Well, we'll see. We do have a guy from uh, Mass though that had a little bit of a uh, flexibility in his position, so he's kind of ruining it for us. But uh, but the thing, it like to be able to for Jack to say, hey, like that helped fire me up, and then before the gold medal game in in Pyeongchang in 2018. I saw like he's normally he has a very set warm up. He's just like a lot of high level national guys. You have a set warm up, you go through it, you're throwing a ball, you're doing everything, right? And I just saw he was sitting in a stall, so I'm like, let me just let me go be spuds. Let me just go have some fun. And I was like, well, hey, I know you're playing D for the first time ever. Well, not ever, but first time on the national team in a long time. Uh, well, at least you get to see out see the whole ice, right? You don't have to constantly be going up and back and up and back. You can actually read the play and you know, at least you know how to do that. And he kind of looked at me, laughed a little bit. And then I saw him leave the locker room. I was like, all right, I think I did my job. And then he told that story again. And I I didn't think very much of it at the time. Like, that's the thing. I think that's the cool part about leadership, though. You don't know when you're having an impact. It's the other person that knows when you're having an impact. And I think that's just, it's just so fun, man. I just, I love having that kind of impact in people's lives because no matter how small it might seem to me, it could mean the world for someone else. I, I can attest to, you know, the power of wanting to do right by your idols, you know, growing up. I grew up in Chicago, you know, much to your uh, dismay in St. Louis, the Chicago Blackhawks were, you know, a powerhouse, although you're a Devils fan. But, you know, I know just being in St. Louis, that St. Louis-Chicago rivalry was pretty brutal there for a couple of years. And oh yeah, I remember, you know, listening to all the idols that, you know, Let's call them the, uh, you know, the founding fathers of the Blackhawks. You know, Patrick Kane, and Jonathan Taze, and Marion Hosa, and Duncan Keith, and I just remember the respect that those guys had uh, around town as professionals, and the way that fans and players that I would run into skates, the the way that they spoke of their intensity, their willingness to prepare. To prepare, and it was like it was such a gift because I knew as a young, I wasn't a pro yet, but about to be, exactly what's expected of me. Like mm-hmm. I this is the standard. If I want anything, you know, really positive to be thought about me or said about me, I really need to honor the standards that have been set, you know, by some of the finest players in the league. And I think, uh, I want to highlight a little bit of your ability to bring humor into, you know, serious situations. Cause a lot of this conversation, you know, is about leadership talk and it can be a little bit heavy, the big moments in life, but your nickname is Spuds, and I want to know, uh, I have an idea, but how did you come about uh, this nickname, and, and you know, why do you practice what you do? Man, so Spuds came along, it was actually that 2009 World Championship, my very first one. We, uh, we had a team warm-up, we brought it in together to have the captain say whatever at the very end, and uh, our trainer kind of put his hand on my head, and he started feeling around. I mean, my head's pretty, pretty solid. And he was like, Oh, it feels kind of like a potato. And then, uh, and then the next day, uh, or the next year we had a, a Christmas gift exchange. And so one of the guys got me a little Mr. Potato head thing. So that was my ritual for the longest time was facing it towards the opponent's locker room. And, uh, I think Pyeongchang was the last time I did it because I mean, been missing arms, legs. I think he's missing an ear. I mean, it worked out. Like I'm missing my legs. He was missing his arms. Like it worked. It worked fine. We bounced yeah, each other out. Yeah, the symbolism isn't lost on me. Yeah. No. And uh, I I just remember our team doctor, the dude, 
funniest guy, most phenomenal guy you're ever going to meet. Most ge- genuinely just enthusiastically happy guy. His name's Mike Eline. He's just, uh, he's actually working, uh, working with COVID patients now. Like he's really just doing some great stuff. But I remember like literally like, cause it's a huge arena, right? It's like an NHL style arena. Mm-hmm. It had 10,000 seats. I remember sending him around like, Hey, you got to figure out where this locker room is. So I know the angle to place him at. And he would go like run through the arena, like past all these checkpoints, trying to figure stuff out. And like, he'd tell me, okay, so you got to push it over there, like exactly at 45 degrees. And like, so that was like, that was the way that I prepared. And, um, I mean, I think like Michael Scott says, I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little stitious. And (laughs) so, uh, I kind of retired that and now I'm just, I'm, I think I'm at the point where I'm confident in my abilities that I don't need a little Mr. Potato head to intimidate my opponents. I'm going to do that on my own. Um, I I wouldn't say by any kind of physicality, just I'm going to try to skate the puck by and take it away so I don't have to actually play defense. And I mean, that's, I think humor's a good way to, to kind of disarm situations, especially like you know, when somebody comes up to me awkwardly and goes, hey, nice legs you got there. Or like, hey, what happened? And it's it's just a fun way to to kind of disarm people because I think prosthetics are scary, apparently. A lot of people get nervous when talking about them. Um, I mean, I'll be honest. These things are probably smarter than I am. They do everything but walk me home from the bar at night. I mean, and like I said, I, I'm not going anywhere with COVID, but um, that was that's my running joke. And so I think you got to you got to have fun with it. I think that's, that's kind of how it is. Like I said earlier, it's, it's a game. Hockey's a game and that's kind of how I treat it. And if I'm not going to have fun with it, then what's the point? I mean, after Vancouver, uh, well, actually after 2011, after Vancouver, I, I was almost ready to pack it up and, and quit playing on the national team. Cause you know, I think a coach was kind of, our coach was kind of abrasive at the time. He was just, he, he wasn't making it fun. I mean, I remember in Vancouver, we, in Vancouver, we played five games. We didn't allow a single goal. We shut out everybody on the way to the gold medal. And the first game, we won like two, three, nothing maybe. And the coach comes in the locker room and he goes, all right, uh, picks out one of our guys. He goes, who do you think was the worst player on the ice today for us? And I, I remember looking around like, is this normal? Like, maybe I'm 17. I don't, and I don't know like what's up, like what weighs up. But like, this doesn't seem right. And so the guy was like, well, I was the worst player. He's not going to throw his teammates under the bus, right? And so I just remember, like, that was kind of like my, man, this is, this is like serious, like serious, but like we're, we're at a point where we didn't play bad. Like, yeah, we can always get better. Don't get me wrong. Like a win doesn't mean we're perfect. But I was like, man, like, why is he just drilling into us? Like we had a shutout, like we played pretty well. And to go from that guy to Jeff Sauer, who was just the most genuinely caring guy. I mean, uh, I was dating a girl and she broke up with me right before world worlds in Norway in 2012. And I remember the first conversation I had with him after we landed was, well, Josh, if you, uh, if you need me to, I'll, I'll write her a letter. I'll, I'll see if she'll ask you, she, wow. see if she'll take you back. And I was like, well, no coach, like it's fine, but man, this guy really cares for me. Like he really cares about like us doing well. And like, to me, that was just such a, a drastic change from you know, the past two years to now we're warming up on the ice with a tennis ball. Like it's okay. These two colors, these two colors, we're just playing with a tennis ball. Go like, this is our warm up. Like he, he made it so fun. He made it tough. Don't get me wrong. Sauer was one of the most demanding guys that I think we've ever had as a coach, but he demanded it in a way that you'd be, you'd feel like you disappointed him. You didn't make him mad. You just disappointed him and no one wanted to disappoint him. And I think that's, I think a hundred percent that's why we had the success because he helped instill that culture that we're still passing on today. And so, I mean, I, I have a whole chapter in my book dedicated to Jeff Sauer cause he was just such a, a great role model for me, but to, to be able to have those people in my life and to be able to do right by them, I think is something I really want to want to honor that. But I mean, just because I had a bad experience with, with a coach earlier doesn't mean I can't take something from that, right? Like I'm someone, I don't always want to have just one or two people that I really look up to. I want to be able to take some things from everyone, right? So like, Connor, I want to be able to take your ability to just start to just get that, get over that initial inertia, right? Like I listen to the podcast and you'll say something, I'll be like, whoa, okay, like the light bulb went off, like it's time to go. 
you know what, from, from Ray Maluda, our coach in 2010, you know what, I want to take that negative experience that I saw and say, I don't ever want to put somebody in a position that makes, that singles them out after something that should be celebrated. And I want to take from Jeff Sauer, I want the one person I'm talking to in front of me to be the most important person in the room, at least to me, because he had a way, I mean, he coached guys like Chris Chelios, Mike Richter, all everybody at U, at uh, Wisconsin. And we could be in the same room with those guys. And if he was talking to you, you were by far the most important person to him. And to me, that's something that I'm looking to replicate. And I want to use, you can always use a little something, whether it's good or bad from everyone, you can always learn something. I'm, I just, I, I think I just love learning. Like it's just new things, new challenges. Um, it's just, it's something new to figure out, you know, like I like finding new recipes, cooking different ways because it's a new way to figure out if I know what I'm doing or not. It's another way to say, well, I can get better at this. Maybe I don't cook that garlic three minutes. Maybe I cook it two and a half and it doesn't brown as much, you know, I mean, trivial stuff, right? But it's always a little bit mentally engaging. And that's the, I think that's just what I'm trying to, to stay focused on, especially in COVID when I'm going to the gym, the rink, the grocery store, um, here <laughs> in my, my apartment. Like I'm not going a whole lot of places. So it's finding ways, especially over this big lull we have to, to be productive and find ways to always get a little bit better. When I think what's so special about what you said about your old coach too, is someone's got to go first, right? So the way I view it is I hope that the world, everyone I encounter sees the best in me. So I kind of have to go first and see the best in them. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, someone in that relationship has to go first. I can't just stubbornly stay on my side of the fence and, you know, throw stones or point fingers and be like, he's negative. You know, he, he's not treating me right. He's disrespect. Mm -hmm. Maybe valid for sure. That might be how I'm feeling. And, and that might be the receiving end. I might be on the receiving end of that power dynamic, but at some point, somebody has got to go first. Um, and I think that that's, you know, beautifully put by yourself. I mean, I think, yeah, you're right. Somebody's got to go first. I think that I've always had that same kind of attitude, like whether it's a drill, whether it's whatever, if somebody's sitting there going, all right, who's going? I'm like, why not me? You know what? I might totally screw it up, but you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to know if I don't try it. Right. Like I'm somebody I'll try anything once I'll try a different foot. I'll try a different knee. Like I'll try a different food. Like you, you, if you don't, if you don't try, you don't know. Right. And so for me, I don't need to be, I, I'm not afraid of failure. And I think that's, I think your relationship with failure has a lot to do with how successful someone is, right? Like you got to be okay with failing. Like I'm not saying that, you know, if I know how to cook and I burn the entire pot, like that's, that's bad failure. That's not something that I can learn from. That's, uh, I wasn't paying attention to it or something, Yeah. but like, you know, I go out and Hey, maybe I'm playing a two on one and a puck sneaks through. Well, you know what? I failed. My bad. I'll fi I'll pick it up and I'll I'll get something next time, right? Like you got to be able to to learn from it like I said and and figure it out along the way cuz for me like I mean, we only get one chance at life, so if I don't like I said, I don't want to look back with any regrets and it's easy to to look back and not have regrets if you just keep trying stuff. Spuds uh where can people find more of you? Where can people find your book if they want to check out more from this conversation? Um, what's your Instagram tag? Yeah, Instagram, uh, Twitter. I'm at SpudsUSA27. Uh, JoshPauls.com is my website. So anybody looking looking for a, a motivational talk, a keynote speech, um, I'm there. I answer those emails. I get back to people. I'm, uh, I have a link to my book there as well. Um, I'll... I'll make sure you have it somewhere if you want to, you might be able yeah, to put it out that. with your stuff. I would but, love uh, that. Yeah. but yeah, I mean, you can find it on Amazon. Um, I prefer you didn't buy it on Amazon. I make more money if you guys uh, buy it through me. So use my link. But, um, but that's like, I have a book, I do talks. Um, but you know what? I'm just, I want to, I want to help out. Right. So if you've got something that, that you might think might work for me, I'd be more than happy to at least give it a look. Like, like my coach, David Hoff always says, you've earned the right to a conversation. The answer might not be what you, the answer might not be what you want to hear, but I'll at least talk with you. I'll walk you through it. I'll, I'll have some fun with it because like I said, I'm willing to try a lot. And right now, I mean, I'm getting to the end of my hockey career. I don't know if N means 10 years, five years, two years. I don't know what that means right now, but I mean, find for me, finding ways to kind of diversify where I'm at and 
finding ways to to help others is really just my goal. Like that's a hundred percent. I was working in finance and every interview I did, I said, I just want to have an impact on someone. Like I just want to have a little bit of an impact on someone, a positive one, obviously. And so I just, I'm hoping to, uh, to get out there and really just make sure that I leave the world a little bit better place. You know, I love that spuds. I've been doing this, this final question to, to wrap up. Um, yeah, but spuds, when I, use the term curious competitor. What does that look like to you? Do you view yourself as someone who is curiously competitive? I hundred percent am. I think when I saw you change the the podcast from Connor Carrick podcast to curious competitor, I'm like one that fits you a hundred percent. But I think I'm always someone looking for, for another way to do it just because the, I think the worst thing you can ever say is we've done, this is just the way we've always done it. Like, why, why aren't we trying to, to find different ways to be better? And I think that's really what curiously competitive is, right? You're always finding a way to get that competitive edge and to be a little bit better than you were yesterday. Like, I'm never going to be better than Steve Cash. I'm never going to be better than Brody Roybal. I'm never going to be better than Declan Farmer. But I can be a better competitor than I was yesterday. And I think that's, that's really what curiously competitive means. That's the win right there. Spuds, thanks for your time today, man. This was awesome. Um, hope you have a great rest of your weekend. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll put your book and, and the link to the website and the show notes and all that for, for people looking. Um, thanks, man. This was awesome. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Like I said, uh, first time caller, long time listener. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you to all of our listeners uh, for staying with us through the rest of this podcast. I want to bring out a couple points from Spuds that I thought were, you know, particularly profound. Uh, one was his he Josh kept coming back to this question he would ask himself in moments of difficulty, and it's pretty simple: Is this helping me? Is talking to myself uh, in a negative fashion helping me? Is being this abrasive with myself helping me? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, then he would you know, simplify his approach and get back to a place um, where he's playing on his own team, where he would, he would nip the self-sabotage. Uh, and secondly, those, these two points are really related. Simplify our goals. How can we, you know, have these credos and these mantras that are so simple that they're tangible, almost like brain tattoos uh, in the moment that we want them. And one of the things that Josh highlighted today that I thought was really beautiful and something that, you know, even I forget to do is leave reflection for quiet time after the event, after the big moment, when it's the time for the test, when it's the time for, you know, physical testing for the the game, the match to, you know, take place, do your best and worry about making your best better at a later date when you have a clear mind uh, and some, you know, open time and maybe some solitude to really, really chew on, you know, what's gone on. And then third, one of the things Spudsy was talking about, you know, even as he reflected on you know, coaches he loved and coaches he didn't care as much for is we really do have an opportunity to learn something from everyone. If it's a coach we don't like, there is something that we can siphon through to find uh, in their message that's helping us. Or furthermore, we can heighten the sense of gratitude that we have uh, when the time comes that we do have a coach that we feel, you know, cares for you and, and that you're playing well under and, and meshes more with your uh, personality. So with those three points in mind, uh, I want to thank Spudsy for you know his time and his story. Um, I, I mentioned uh, in the wrapping up of the podcast, we'll do all the, the link to his book and, and to the show notes uh, and to his website in the show notes. Thank you for joining us week in, week out. Please continue to like, uh, subscribe, comment, and most importantly, share with loved ones that you feel uh, can benefit from our conversations uh, week in, week out. Thank you for doing this and I look forward to seeing you next week.